discuss with the uh, SLDS grant. Okay. Um, and why don't we just go around, make sure everyone knows who everyone is. Uh, I'm Matt Cohen, part-timer, long <laughs> consultant, uh, working with Chris and Allie and Shelby in the performance and impact. And who wants to go next? I'll go. Uh, Shelby Robertson, our director of accountability at the department and super fan of the regional data leads. <laughs> wait, wait till you have more time with them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You'll even be more super fan. <laughs> I'm Ali D'Angelo. I'm the executive director for the Center for Performance and Impact. Hey, Chris Wollard, senior executive director, Performance and Impact. Hey. Uh, Kathy Heidelberg, ESC of Central Ohio, um, served to coordinate state trainings and a regional data lead. That's those are my primary responsibilities. <laughs> I'm Jackie Miller from Brown County ESC and a regional data lead and OTES trainer and professional learning. Great. Uh, Christy Graves, North Central Ohio ESC Director of Curriculum. Sorry, I was just finishing up another. So <laughs> I apologize. Uh, Suzette Jackson, I was at Mahoning County. Now I'm in Warren City and have been part of this for a little while. Um, and, wait, 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 soon to be executive director, apparently. Longtime supporter of Ohio Department of Education and data fanatic. <laughs> fanatic, that's what we need, more fanatic. What was that, man? I couldn't quite hear you. We need more, we need more fanatics. <laughs> Tammy, there. Are you still, okay. can you hear? Are you ready for me? Yes. Tammy Hambrick, I'm the newbie. Um, on the team, but not newbie to the work. Um, I've been a value added leader and Diva and Reva and all the other value added names you can come back up with from the past and uh, curriculum supervisor at the South Central Ohio Educational Service Center. And uh, I do all of the work named above. So thank you for having me. I'm excited to be Welcome. here. Welcome. Glad to have you. All right. Michelle. And um, Michelle Moore, SST5 director and regional data lead. Okay. The door behind me has been closed, so I'm stuck here. <laughs> so, um, sorry, Matt, real quick, I also wanted to say we've got Brittany Neisel on the line as well. Um, Brittany. Brittany, if you have the opportunity to unmute and introduce yourself, feel free. If not, I will help out. <laughs> Yeah, no problem. Hi, everyone. I'm Brittany. Um, I do admin support for the Center and the Office of Accountability. Um, let me know if you need anything after the meeting today. Um, I am recording it. Great. Thank you very much, Brittany. Appreciate it. All right. Um, Chris, you're on. Uh, people have been asking, you know, where's where where's OD taking this thing with the RDLs and what do we what should we be expecting in the future? I thought maybe if we could start off with a little bit of your perspective and get into this discussion. So anybody just feel free to chime in at any time, but Chris, take it away. Sure, well, good morning, everyone. Um, it's been some kind of week. It's been sort of excruciating, actually. Uh, there's been a lot of math this week. That's been sort of interesting. Um, in fact, last last night about 10 o'clock, my, my kids had been watching CNN all night. And then uh, one of my high schoolers was in here uh, doing chemistry homework, which I thought was funny because he'd been home for two days. I don't know why he was just doing it at 10 o'clock last night. And, and he was uh, struggling with some balancing some chemistry equations. And so I sat down and 
And I started doing it with him and I kind of helped him with one problem. Then I was like, well, this is really fun. <laughs> I sat down there for like a half hour balancing equations. Like, you know, you can leave now. You can go. I got that. <laughs> So the, the math nerd in me came out. So um, anyway, I hope everybody's uh, doing well. Um, you know, Matt sort of asked me to talk a little bit about the vision. And again, I think you guys have probably heard me talk about this a little bit before. Um, and, you know, one, uh, I think the vision hasn't changed much, but I think the questions around the situation that we're in um, related to this pandemic and especially equity concerns that are only going to be exacerbated by this make this work even more important than it already was. Um, and, and, I, and I think that's something that, you know, that our department leadership, I, I know that, that Paulo, um, you know, if you hear Paulo talk, Paulo talks about RDLs on a, on a daily basis. Um, and I think, you know, part of it's the, uh, we've, we've got a lot of good, we've got, I think we've got a lot of good positive energy out there and a lot of good, um, but how do we, how do we build on that? Um, you know, big picture, you know, where the department has been going is one is a focus on continuous improvement. Um, again, that's that's, you know, as we look at our of what what we view our mission to be is a, is a real focus on continuous improvement across the system. And obviously data is key to that. Um, and that takes many forms, whether that's the various data tools, the various data supports. How can we help create the context to, to use data to drive continuous improvement? And we really believe that this network that we've this grassroots network really that that you all have been creating is a, is a, is a critical piece to that. Um, but I think one of the things that we've heard both pre pandemic and even now is sort of like, all right, what, do, how, what does this thing need to be when it grows up? <laughs> right. We've, we've got we've got some we've, we've got some we made some great steps. We've got a great thing here, but it's sort of like, all right, how do we how do we move forward with it? You know, I think we started a, a lot of this conversation um, again pre pandemic. and We did the road show. Uh, I forget which month it was. <laughs> it was last winter, maybe. I don't know. It was it was about a year ago. Um, and a lot of that was to meet with the ESE superintendents to help ha have conversations with them, to sort of understand where this is going. And I thought th I thought those were really good conversations. Um, and obviously, one of the things that frequently comes up around this work is sort of how to fund it, right? I mean, and sometimes it's that, that that's sort of the reality is is that the resources and sort of how to fund that work are a big part of this conversation. And, you know, I think a lot of where we've been going is one is how, you know, you know, again, we do not have a dedicated GRF state funding line. Ideally, we get to a point where we do have that. Um, but, you know, where we're at now is that one, we believe that there's a demand for the work and services uh, that the network provides. And so how can we both build on that, learn from it and help market it? So within each of the ESCs and the various differences of the, of the business models that you all have, <clears throat> how can we build on that to help, you know, build the demand in the network? Um, two, um, we've always committed to being very aggressive and seeking um, additional funding and grant opportunities. And I think we've had two really big successes of that this year, uh, which we're going to spend a lot of time talking about today. Um, and we'll continue to do that. Um, and then third, I think part of this is, you know, showing the value again, showing the value that the more we can demonstrate the, the, the how the good things that we are doing and how it makes a difference, that in future years that helps make continue to make a case in a state budget to the General Assembly to say, look, this is important. And if the and if the state's going to spend, a, you know, how many billions of dollars and invest all these things and all these policies, we need to have an apparatus there to help to help support it. And I think to me, that's one of that to me, that's always one of the long term goals is making sure that we're showing what we're doing so that we can continue to make that case to to policymakers. So so that being said, there's, a, you know, a couple other things that I'll mention. Um, you know, one, uh, we have been partnering with the data quality campaign. Um, if you're familiar with the data quality campaign, they're a national um, data advocacy group. Uh, we have a pretty close relationship with them. Um, one of the things that we've done over the past year was to conduct a needs assessment. Um, uh, we, we've been, uh, John Richard, who's the assistant superintendent, and I have been sort of involved with a policy, of, uh, a problem of practice kind of network with them. And our our problem of practice was how do we build on this? How do we ne how do we network? How do we build awareness and communicate what the RDL network does? And so one of the things that they did was a needs assessment. Um, if you, I don't know if that this group has seen it. If not, we will send that out today. 
Um, so the, and, um, it's really interesting stuff. I, I ask you just not to share it too widely, be, uh, not is there anything we don't want to share. It's just, it just hasn't gone out yet. So we haven't had a chance to sort of communicate what all's in there, but it, it's pretty interesting. And, and, you know, they, they did, um, some focus groups. They did some interviews with district superintendents and some ESC superintendents to kind of ask some of these questions. Um, a few of the highlights in there that I think are both consistent with what we've been thinking and hearing and sort of driving some of our work is one is this need to sort of more formalize the structure in the organization of this network. You know, I think that both one of the, you know, one of the great benefits of, of you know, why that there's such interest in this is because it's been so such a sort of a grassroots effort um, and it's really been a, a co-designed effort, but at the same time, there's a, there seems to be a need to sort of formalize the structure um, as we sort of add, as, as we sort of move forward. And that was one of the key things that came out of that needs assessment. Um, again, I think that the needs assessment got a lot of support for continuing to expand the network, but also a focus on how do we communicate what we're doing in a, in a, in a more coherent, organized way. Um, and then a couple other notes in there that are less about structure, but more about where there's a need. Um, and I won't spend too much time talking about it, but we did hear a need to one, focus on principles and to two, kind of um, do more work in the high school realm. So one of the themes that came out of that needs assessment was that there's a lot of, there seems to be a lot more structure and a lot more work happening just for a lot of reasons um, at the, the elementary and middle school levels. Um, and that, that high schools across the state just seem to be lagging behind and sort of how to, how to think through and, and use these kind of structures and supports. And that was one of the things that came up. So anyway, I will share that with you. Take a look at it. I think it's some really good things, but it's, you know, it's both consistent and driving a lot of what we're thinking. And in particular on that formalizing the structure piece, and because I think that's something that, you know, that, that we're going to talk about today. It was part of the SLDS grant. So kind of a few other things, and I'll turn it over. I think one of our big questions that we want to really focus is sort of the the how do we know question, um, and we're we're focusing on that across the board. Um, you know, one of the things is we look at improvement activities. Of Paulo asks us uh, asks our team pretty frequently, how do we know that schools are improving? <laughs> and um, and and the, one of the challenging parts to that is for years we don't have a good answer for it. Um, I think we believe from a policy perspective that the OIP and the structures we put in place are the right things. Um, they're built on decades of research. We know that there's lots of good things happening. Uh, we know that there's a lot of good good work happening, but from a state perspective, it's always sort of been a struggle to say, how do, how do we know that the system's improving and, and how, do we, how do we identify um, schools and buildings um, that are improving in a, in, a, in, a, in, a more com in a more comprehensive way. Sure, we could look at performance index and say, yeah, somebody's making some making some strides, but that's not the more comprehensive look at how do, how can we say people are improving. So that's one of the big things that's that, that's driving our work. And I think that also fits into again, how do we know that the work that this network is doing is making a difference? And so the things that we're putting together and the work that we're doing, let's make sure we're always asking those questions because one it it's designed to like our own continuous improvement, um, but also to help us continue to make the case to policymakers that this is really valuable and it's worthy of um, additional investments. Um, so I sort of challenged us this year to really focus on that question. Um, and then kind of, you know, a couple other things we have, there's a couple of big drivers for this work. Um, you know, as I mentioned before that, you know, we will continue to explore opportunities to get funding. Um, the SLDS grant was a, both a big one in terms of, um, of actual funding, um, you know, as a federal grant, there's a lot of interest in this. I think I think we've heard from a lot of federal partners um, along the lines of, boy, Ohio is doing some interesting stuff here. So there's there's a lot of interest in this work, um, and so we think that the pieces are are driving a lot of the priorities that we want to we want to get to. Um, and it's and it's it, to me it's it's a great stepping stone. Um, likewise, we are. Um, going to invest a fairly significant chunk of our CARES dollars um, into some into um, some supports. Um, I don't know that we're necessarily talking about that today, but that's a, that's another that's another big investment. So again, um, that's sort of my my take on where we're headed. I hope that's consistent with everybody <laughs> everybody else. I've been seeing a lot of people nodding as I'm talking, so I usually take that as, as, as a good sign. So I think we've got so again, I, I continue to believe that this work is critical, that we've got a lot of great people and a lot of great things going on. And it's just sort of like, how do we, how do, how do we make sure that all that effort and momentum doesn't 
get lost. I mean, because the state probably has a history of that kind of thing of really good things we got going that we haven't quite figured out how to take it where it's going next. Um, and we want to make sure that that's not the case with all this work. So anyway, that's all I got. Hey, Chris, could I ask you a question? Sure. So here's my question. And so I'm, I'm on this new kick right now of summarizing everything in basically two seconds or less. And I appreciate all of the detail you gave there. I thought it was very helpful. My question to you would be is this, is if we needed to explain that to a stakeholder, what's coming in, what would be the two sentences or less say, say would you say is the direction going? Um, what stakeholder do you have in mind? <laughs> Don't know that I have one particular. I just know that those are the questions coming up. May, maybe looking at it from school district lenses. If you were explaining this to a school district, what's going on, or an ESC, what what would you say? Sure. Well, again, um, that, that's a really that's really. I should have my elevator speech down. Look, I, I think this is, and I and I think. Let me let me take a long way around and explain, and then come and give you my answer to this. I think one of the things that's a challenge, is to figure out the role the RDL network in relationship to the SSTs um, in, a, in a context of sort of an ESC world where there's obviously always a little, there's, there's always a little bit of, always a little bit of tension in that. And I, I get that. And I'm not, I'm not sure what the immediate answer to that is. In my brain, how I look at it is that, you know, if, if the SSTs are designed to provide intensive supports to the, to um, our identified most struggling schools, that the RDL network is designed to provide continuous improvement, database con continuous improvement supports to the other schools and districts. So that's one. It's like for everybody in this, we, we for everybody in the state, we think continuous improvement is important. We think the RDL network can help provide those supports. Um, we want to make it both easier to do that, have a better understanding of what the work does, and provide resources um, so that ESCs. Um, and all the other various partners that are involved can be successful in doing that work. So I don't know if that answers okay. your question. I don't know if it's sort of as neat and tidy, but that's that would be my first take at that. That helps. Thank you. I'm trying to unmute myself. And if that's the wrong, and, and, and believe me, <laughs> if, if if that's the wrong direction, or if there, you know, if that needs to be, you know. That's that's my take, and that's and part of you know part of what we've been committed to this all along is making sure that this was not kind of a a, t a top down thing that you know that we're really trying to make sure that it's co designed, <laughs> and so um, if there um, if that you tell me <laughs> two two things that I think that you said are increasingly important, Chris, the idea of the support to our principals, and then secondly that high school piece. Um, you know, it, it, it's always been about elementaries and elementary data and all these sources that we have in place and, um, high schools kind of need to come along with that, you know? Yeah. So, and, and a lot of them just don't even know where to start, to be honest. So, and I, sorry, I think my charger. I think another, I, another reason or another thing to think about that um, tends to drive the engagement of the stakeholders, whether they be just at the district level or the building level or the classroom level. And I hate to say this because this is a bad word for some people, the accountability system. So the when the accountability system is clearly in place and people understand it, they have interest in the data and want the data to look good. And then when Unfortunately, what many times, what I've observed through many years of being a diva, a reva, a value-added leader, all that, when maybe the, the lens moves away from the accountability system, whether it be the report card or OPEZ, OTEZ, whatever, the interest seems to wane, you know, in terms of understanding and using the data. Oh, gosh, we're not worried about that right now because we... You know, we're not using that right now. So how do we how do we integrate those two things, understanding the accountability system, understanding data as part of it and having an impact on data? So and, and how and how that's a good point, Kathy, and how it all is so integral, like, you know, our attendance, our, you know, 
early warning systems are, you know, like how are we using all this in combination or in tandem? In a I agree. Oh, I'm sorry. A oh, go ahead, Suzette. COVID, a benefit of COVID this year was the accountability system did shed a light on the high school because we did have that piece. So for the first time, I was asked about why is our prepared success prepared for success so low? And it's because we don't focus on that. We focus on the K-3 literacy piece, and then we move into that middle school. You know, middle school is hammered with it. And by the time they get up to that junior, senior level, it's just kind of slowed down. So now this year with that, we finally have support and saying, oh wait, the high school has two major indicators on the accountability system, graduation and prepared for success. We can fix all we want down below, but if we're not getting them to leave at a good level, what good is it? I don't, that's why I, I, I like the accountability system because it really allows us to look at the whole big picture and gives us more of a detailed place of where to start. So this year, our focus is prepared for success. I, I appreciate you sharing that because I'm I am a both huge believer and a huge advocate for the prepare for success. I also think we need to take it to prepare for success 2.0. Um, mm -hmm. if, if, if you've seen That's what we, if you've seen what we did with the um, with the the career tech report card, even though, even though even though it got a little bit messy in some of the details, I think the concept of what they did there was where we'd like to take it. Um, you know, so it's going to, the reality is it's going to be, a, it's going to be a messy year-ish <laughs> for accountability. Um, you know, we'll, if, if it, if it does, <laughs> you know, there's there so many unknowns, um, including whether it's a DeVos, De, DeVos administration or something else. So there's a ton of unknowns. Um, and so I think, I think continuing to both make connections and show why the data is important throughout this that allows us to, um, you know, whatever whatever we need to do with the accountability system to address the, thing, the, the various things that happen over the next year. Like we don't want to start from scratch. Uh, mm -hmm. And we think the data is important. And, you know, for, for me, for me, like your point around, well, if, if, if schools and districts are finding the prepare for success data va valuable and thinking about their outcomes for kids, but there are other things that they're thinking about. It's much easier to make the case of, well, when we come out of this, these are the things that the accountability system should be factoring in instead of saying, well, no, no, we shouldn't be worried about college or career readiness or something like that. So again, that's that's sort of messy, but you know, I think that's one of the things we're gonna have to maneuver over the next year. Chris, if I could jump in and just piggyback on something you said also though about the OIP process. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you said Paulo asking about, you know, are we making a difference? You know, I don't know how many of you have the opportunity, but I mean, in our small area, we work uh, a great deal with facilitating the Ohio improvement process for our non-intensive districts. And that's where I see the integration of the data and the continued driver behind the data, because on a regular basis, as long as we can keep that OIP moving and um, the districts meeting regularly, we are looking at data on a regular basis at, through all buildings um, prepared for success we've had those conversations now i can say for high schools at least in our area to some extent they felt like prepared for success was uh, written in a way that they were very uh, it was going to be very difficult that indicator so mm -hmm. to some extent they had written that off i mean that's not a great thing to do but when they looked at it closely they were like we really can't make a huge impact here in any reasonable amount of time so um, or have the resources so we're going to focus on some other things they continue to look at it and try to make a difference but it, it was just a really tough one to to actually move the needle on but um, i just want to throw in there as far as integration the continued support of the ohio improvement process i think is vital to the data work in integrating the rdls into that system that we already have i think is is huge yeah and I as a okay. yeah. Yeah. yeah, so you know, I appreciate that, Tammy, and again, I think that's a good point. And 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 I hope when I said that earlier, I didn't mean to imply that there isn't good things happening. I think I think at a state level, our challenge is we know that there are good things happening when people are implementing OIP with fidelity. What's hard is at a state level to sort of step back like from a research perspective and say 
<laughs> here, you know, quantify. It, it's almost the quantifying it at the state level that becomes a challenge. So we, so we, you know, we, we have a great interest in building on our research capacity to, to understand those things because I think we know uh, when it's done when, when when it's done well when it's done with fidelity that that this is that, that this is the right work. Um, and so you know, our challenge is how do we how do we how do we document that? How do we you know um, get our get our hands around that at, at a more well, collective. Let's make that into a question. So do any of you guys have any suggestions that we could start to look at in terms of documentation of you know, how, how the system is moving and your, how your role as RDLs is supporting that? I mean, besides, besides the, uh, the report card itself. I mean, the... So I think one of the things that, and I, it kind of ties to something that Kathy said, and I think it, it answers your question, Matt, to a certain level. I know that as RDLs, we tend to look at the quantitative side of things, but I think the qualitative side of things in this is really, really helpful. And I think potentially one role of, of the RDLs is to provide some type of high quality professional learning for principals or for high school teachers or for whoever that is. And that qualitative evidence that comes from that, even those exit surveys and even the conversations I've had with people since we did that round of training last year, two years ago, I don't even remember how long ago that was at this point in time, has been really important. And I think if we capture some of those success stories, that only feeds into what's going on. I'll give you one particular example, Matt, that I'm thinking of. So after Christy and I did, um, that one uh, train up in our area back in January, uh, you know, we got a lot of good positive qualitative feedback. And then one of those uh, principals that was there came back a couple of months ago and says, hey, because you showed me how to do this, now my master schedule is doing this. And as a result, I'm now seeing an increase in achievement because I got the right kids with the right teacher now at this point in time, which is something that is quantitative, but at the end of the day, it's also qualitative. Well, I think I think the important thing here is somehow to be able to document this in some uh, uh, formalized manner. So because, you know, otherwise we're just sort of telling stories on ad hoc with people. And, uh, you know, while that that goes so that, that does help, I mean, don't get me wrong. Uh, I think it's going to be necessary to somehow bring that together so that uh, people can see Yes, this is something that is happening. Well, I guess where I was going with that, maybe I didn't finish it, is they have a direct, um, I mean, they were using internal common assessment data and they saw a direct improvement already. I mean, that, that to me is very quantifiable. Whatever their local metric was, they've already seen an improvement just based on that type of training that they've gotten, um, that they've went to and supported. Yeah, I, I would um, just say, to the the idea and concept of this um we will definitely come back to when we talk about like formalizing the structure and thinking about um some committees and suggestions i have of like how do we have formal place for measuring the impact and and things with the network so i'm excited to hear that we're already going to lead there and um if we want to combine that with a later discussion that'll that'll work too yeah just playing off that i i think in terms of clear definitions of roles and responsibilities will be very helpful in terms of one of the things that was said earlier, where, what is the responsibility for, that the state support team has? Where is the responsibility that the ESC has? How do we complement each other? How, how do we work together? What is expected of that relationship? Because I think sometimes it's communication very territorial. Like, oh, you can't get involved in these districts because these are our districts. So I'd really like to know what ODE's uh, position is on that. And maybe that will come out in the roles and responsibility discussion. And if I could just tag on to what Kathy said, because in my area, working with my SST, it's almost the opposite. We're almost so connected and working together, or at least attempting to, that, you know, when you stated that, Chris, that the SST is working with intensive and the RDLs through ESCs would, would really be working with rest of the districts, we overlap so much that maybe we do need to define our roles a little bit better and really understand 
that it, that working together is great and we have a great relationship with our SST, but at the same time, maybe we're missing some things because of that. So I like that whole, let's, let's really look at all of the system and how it can work together, but still everyone's doing their job. And I recognize when I say that, that's a very broad generalization. Sure. <laughs> of it. And obviously it's much more complicated when you get into SST performance agreements that SST is going to do a lot of things, you know, and, and there's obviously a lot of mixing that, and that's part of the challenge. But to me, that in my head, that's how I always, always try to separate it. It's like, from my perspective, the, we need, we need a, a continuous improvement network for the entire state. And different people are going to need different things, and some people are going to need more support than others. Um, but whatever we're doing, we should make things available to everybody. And the SSTs are going to target that for those who are – most in need as defined from a federal perspective, basically. Um, and that, but we want to make sure that we've, that everybody can benefit from those things. And then, the, and then, and then it's just like, okay, how do you sort of figure out the, the, all the details of it? Exactly. I will say that is the Chris Willard opinion. Um, you know, the, he may talk to other people at ODE who, who have slightly different views of that. I don't, I don't think so, but you know, that's, I, I will say that that's. Well, I also think Chris at, at, at some level, trying to communicate that within ODE so that you're, you know, you have other people have an idea of what this group is about because there are other people who are not part of RDLs who are overlapping certainly in, in a lot of the support work. I mean, they're out there doing stuff. And part of the challenge, I think, is going to be how to make this consistent so that the messaging that, that people, that the supports do with the school districts is consistent and also that there's not over so much overlap that from the point of view of the school districts it looks like there's people coming at them from left and right and up and down and you know yeah i mean if, if you're if you're a uh, in a school you want to know who to talk to you like who do i talk to and how can you help me right and so it's like in some ways it doesn't matter you know it's just like how do you how do you help them understand what they need and who's the people that can help them at the moment, we do have a group, by the way, within ODE that meets occasionally uh, that consists of people like Johanna Ward, uh, Cindy Dewey, um, uh, 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 Jill Grubb. So, I mean, there's that the connections are being made uh, around and the discussion is around the RDL. So, I mean, you know, the, that I think is something that would enhance our ability to um, understand where the duplications are and, and where the overlaps are and where the, the congruities are as well. And this is probably a bigger conversation than just RDLs because I think we're, we've had a lot of growing pains around PBIS and the role of ESC and SST. So I think there's a lot of intersection um, across different areas of work that we can learn from. But uh, at least in our area, it looks different for every ESC that we support because every ESC functions so differently. So the role of SST, like say in Ashtabula, where they don't have an RDL, then we provide more universal support there versus, you know, Mahoning has strong people. So we partner with them, but we can, you know, define our work. So I think it's even within an SST, it's very dependent on how each ESC functions. But uh, like I said, I think we could learn from other areas of work on how to define roles and, and how do we negotiate supports. Yeah. You, know, when, you know, when you all did your introductions, you know, I had you said something about your roles a little bit, and you could see that there's a lot of variety even among the, the seven of you in terms of, you know, con you know I, work with I, I work with teacher evaluation, I work with curriculum, I work with, you know, there's a lot of different aspects many of which uh over again overlap but you know i i guess part of the issue is as we start to have the next conversation which is about the slds and and different ways of looking at it you know the focus shifts a little bit from specifically around uh the improvement aspect to other things that are related or different ways of looking at improvement, uh, I guess, is perhaps a different thing to say. And this creates a situation where, uh, you know, what is an RDL discussion that we're going to have to have? Uh, and also uh, what distinguishes an RDL from other things? Because 
you know, otherwise we're just sort of just part of the blob of stuff that goes supporting the, the school districts. So, uh, you know, those things have to be kept in mind, sort of a, what is the boundary and what's the permeability of the boundary, I, I would think of it. Okay, any other thoughts about, uh, you know, you know, I, you, you ask me very, you all ask me often that you want to make sure that what you're doing is in sync with what the department's grand vision is here. Uh, I think, you know, it's not so much that it's a grand vision, it's a vision of how we ought to move ahead. And uh, I want to make sure that, you know, as we leave here, you feel that you have a better understanding because uh, in many ways, you're the people who need to have that, that understanding if we're going to make this, uh, this uh, network work. Do you have any more questions for Chris? Everyone knows everything. <laughs> or <Right>. nothing. <laughs> no, no, no. All right, let's uh, let's move on in the in the agenda. The next item. Uh, so this is this is uh, we want to talk about the SLDS, the statewide longitudinal data system. Uh, the, in particular, the project four. There are four projects in there. We've had the discussion about what those are, but you know, building resources for regional data leads. And um, Allie, do you want to start off with that a little bit? Sure. Um, so we've talked about the SLDS um, in previous meetings, but just to remind you of what this outcome for is all about and then um, give you an update as to where we are. So um, if you remember, um, this grant um, is looking at the use of data, not so much building the data systems, but then how do we build some tools to really dig in and help um, buildings and districts use those data. So the other outcomes build the tools, um, an early warning system, a teacher equity tool, etc. And then our outcome, outcome four, um, looks at, OK, how do we support districts and buildings and educators in using those tools um, and other tools that are already in place um, for school improvement? So, um, what we've done is we have drafted an RFP um, that asks for um, an ESC or group of ESCs to come together and co-design with us some training on each of those new tools um, with the subject matter experts. So not starting from scratch. You don't need to be an expert in early warning system or teacher equity, um, but co-designing some training and then um, figuring out how an RDL would be credentialed in those subject areas. Um, not just the tools that are being built by the grant, but special education data um, and, and other things. So, um, you know, kind of the, the vision of this is to take RDLs beyond value added. So saying that there, there might be in the future RDLs out there who never go to SAS and are not value added experts, but they might be experts in teacher equity, special ed and early warning. Um, and they would be credentialed um, thusly. So it's ex expanding the breadth of what an RDL can be and what assistance they can give to ed educators. And then in some cases, it will expand the depth of knowledge that um, current or future RDLs have in those uh, subject areas. So um, emphasis on co-design with the department, um, making it work for all of you out there in the network um, and and figuring out what makes sense um, for credentialing and, and what um, RDLs need to know and be able to do, just like our students. And um, we have, uh, like I said, we have we have drafted the RFP. 
it now um, has left our control and is with our fiscal people and then it will go to DAS and we just like cross our fingers and hope that nothing delays it dramatically. Um, but we're looking for a December release of that um, RFP. And it is for over half a million dollars. Um, so it's a nice, um, it's a nice bucket of money to do this work, um, get some money out to the ESCs and the RDLs for this work, and then um, really focus on a, a co-design process. Um, and Matt can talk more about the micro-credentialing matrix that we have put together, but does anyone have any questions about the process or where we're going with this? Or to my colleagues, anything that I left out? Okay, so I think that, um, and might, we might come back to that that thought in a moment, but uh, the things I left out, <laughs> whatever. Well, no, I said if they have any questions. <coughs> Excuse me. So, uh, as a result of of working on the RFP, we we put together uh, a document that starts to get at that issue of what we mean by uh, credentialing. And I, if you, you probably want to should pull up that and make sure you are, you're looking at the uh, that grid. Uh, what I have, what we have on there is um, on the left side co uh, column is the strands or the credentials, if you will, uh, that we're looking at. So there are seven of them. You'll see that value-added data uh, for student progress is one of them. Uh, and we can talk more about that. But then at the top, it shows uh, four different columns uh, going across, uh, understanding data sources, understanding data use and interpretation, navigating use of the data, and facilitating data conversation. So we started thinking about this in, in those four uh, four areas. So to say, pretty much to say that if you're going to be credentialed, uh, it's about these are the four general topics that you're going to be credentialed that are going to lead to that credential. Now, it doesn't necessarily apply in the same way to each of the credentials. Uh, for some, the tool is, in fact, uh, critical uh, and it's out there and you really work with the tool to uh, to help understand the data. I mean, that, that is the process that, that you go through. Similarly, uh, that, that would be sort of like uh, how you use EVOS uh, right now. Uh, but nevertheless, the we're sort of separating out the kind of the use of the tool, the navigation process, uh, things of that sort from understanding the the the, the metrics, understanding the the way that uh, we talk about the data and, and how the, those data come together. And then finally, uh, the facilitating of the data conversations is sort of what we expect RDLs to do in terms of uh, the support for school districts. In other words, you sit down, you have some kind of uh, interaction with somebody in the school district, and how you do that is critical to being able to communicate uh, all this information. Uh, and it's done in, in many different ways. So we want people to be facile in all of these areas, all these four categories uh, in each of these, in, in any one topic to get a credential. Uh, the, the vision that we have right now is that, I think Ali mentioned it, is that uh, you, know, you could be credentialed in one topic, you could be credentialed in seven topics, uh, doesn't matter from our perspective, uh, other than your utility with the school districts is pre presumably would be greater if you're in if you're credentialed in more than one. Uh, and in fact, it means, for example, and again, this is what Ali just said, was uh, was that uh, there are going to be people who are not going to be credentialed in value added and do not go to SAS. So I guess I'd like to get your impression and thoughts about this kind of 
framework because uh, that's what we have. That's really what we want your feedback on is is how do you view this and uh, is there something that we're either missing in, in the process or are we thinking this in a very different way than than maybe you would. So uh, the question is maybe the specific question is what do you think about having an RDL network where some people are not credentialed in value added have not gone to SAS. Uh, that's been sort of the glue that ties the, the group together up to now. What would that mean to you? So, Matt, I have a question. So does each of the numbers on this matrix represent a credential? Is that what you're in? Is that the what you're seven, saying? The seven, the seven, no, not each of the numbers. Each of the numbers in the thing represent a, a training aspect to the credentials. The credentials are the seven Strand. uh, str strands, right? Okay. And uh, then yeah. the for strand, you know, for strand one, for example, uh, you, know, you just what you would see is that you know this you would have to. How do you understand the data source? Yeah. And notice that that's always number one because we haven't been able to think through yet how to distinguish between understanding data sources for any of these strands. And likewise, for facilitating a data com conversation, we haven't made any dis distinction around the content of the of the conversation. So perhaps the no knowing uh, that you have field experience, demonstration of knowledge and skill about having a conversation is works for any of these uh, strands. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Uh so um, I have a few questions on this, Matt. Um, like, where would you envision, like, let's say early childhood as an example, step up to quality, all that kind of the. Um, right. So a good, Christy, that's a good point. We're missing some things. OK, so, you know, this was this is coming out of the of this particular SLDS grant. OK, OK. I didn't know if uh, things were and, tough and, to thin. And, OK. And we we certainly could be thinking of expanding the strands, but of course, tied to this is there's going to be some kind of training. Now, you know, let me give you. Let's just think about SAS as an example, because <clears throat> value added student academic progress right now that consists of SAS University, SAS EVOS University, and the EVOS tool. Uh, and the roster verification tool that go with it. Uh, part of the training that you go through in that is, my understanding anyway, is to uh, think about uh, how you how you work with school districts using the EVOS tool. So at right now, that is kind of the 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 uh, prototype of what we were thinking about in terms of thinking about what a strand. Uh, what it would take to to get a credential. <clears throat> now, now, Matt, could you test out of some of these? Because, you know, I guess I'm thinking like, you know, teacher evaluation data, O test tool. I mean, shoot, I've been a state trainer since. Right. I mean, I, is that something you can test out of or that well, are you envisioning? I, I, we, we might say we might say, for example, and this goes to strand number seven. <clears throat> that in order to uh, in order to get this, you either have to have the particular training that comes out of this, or uh, you have to have a, uh, a be a, an OTES trainer. Maybe we could say OTES trainer is just a prerequisite for it. So and and, so, and maybe there's something else. Maybe there isn't. Uh, you know, again, uh, this yeah, is all. I, I don't know. Just. Yeah, something's coming up. And then like this idea of e of SAS, um, can can someone test out of that, let's say? I mean, you and I both know of probably one person, a few people, handful of people who probably can, let's say, test out of that, let's say. <laughs> um, I know SAS is a great thing and I I loved my experience there. Um, but is that possible using this micro credentialing? 
None of none of that has been determined. Okay. I mean, that's, yeah, that's, so that's, that is what the, the grant is to implement. Find a, that. Okay. Implement a yep. program and a train and the, and the training to go with it to to to, deal, okay. to put together this. Yeah. So, so see Shelby's comment. Like part part of what our contractors will do is help us. This is just a draft, just to give you a sense of like what we're thinking. But the one of the final products of the um, RFP deliverables will be figuring this out with okay. us. Yeah. So do each of those 18, let's just call them modules. I mean, does that represent a training, like a training module, each of those different? Uh, it could, yes. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of how we've been thinking about it, Kathy. That's a great, yeah. Well, let me go back. <clears throat> let me go back to my other question, though, um, because you know, you guys, especially having been part of this sort of activity for so long, uh, have have invested a lot of your time and, and effort into making sure that you are uh, really conversant in uh, things like EVOS and the progress data and how it applies in different uh, in different ways. And certainly when we first created the RDL network, it was it was very much around that uh, training that uh, that all that you all had. This is a little bit different. It expands both the nature of what the uh, RDL network is all about. It puts different emphasis on it uh, in, in different ways. Uh, certainly, you know, my expectation here is that, for example, uh, many of the SSTs would have many people uh, getting the, uh, the credential in the special education piece. And, and maybe only have that. And that would be part of the network too. So Matt, would they be part? So any RDL or network member can credential or people can credential and not be in the RDL network. What, what are your thoughts on that? My thoughts are your thoughts. Okay. What, <laughs> you, know, what, you know, this is the, this is the question that we're trying to raise. Okay as an implication for where we're going with this. So um, anyone who has a credential who has achieved or completed some of these modules is eligible, so to speak, to be in the RDL network, but you would be identifying them as to what strand their credential so, is. So right now, that, we have, we have an right now we have an identification for you very publicly. It's uh, on that RDL page with that map uh, and that lists the people who are RDLs. Now, presumably, uh, those of you, and maybe most of you, maybe, you know, how, how do we, what do we say about you're getting a value-added credential? Well, do we grandfather the fact that you already went there? Is there something else that you need to do? All those are questions that have yet to be determined uh, through this process. But just suppose we say, okay, the 75 of you now have a uh, credential there and we're going to list that credential. Now there's other people who have other credentials or you have other credentials as well. And so one thing that we could be doing simply to make this very public is to put on that map. Here's Kathy Heidelberg and here's the three credentials she has. Uh, now it becomes very meaningful if it has some value to school districts. And this goes back to Chris's question about how do we, you know, determine that we're making a difference, how, that you're making a difference. And so, you know, if you're making a difference and people can see it in terms of helping teachers understand uh, OTES and things of that sort, uh, you know, then they might want to have somebody who has a, a, the teacher evaluation credential work with them. This is from the department's point of view. This would be some kind of a, a, a way of saying, here are people who we expect can help you. Mm -hmm. uh, from the school district's perspective, it would be, you know, it's not just that the ESC is sending me anybody. 
they're sending me somebody who has this credential in special education and knows their stuff. Okay. That's, you know, and now, of course, this gets into the issue of how the ESCs and SSTs uh, make their money, basically, right? And uh, again, if you have the people uh, at your ESC who have credentials and therefore know something and are good at doing this work uh, that is worthwhile to school districts, presumably that's a benefit to both. Matt, I, if you're asking us if, um, I mean, the way you just stated that, that people who have already participated in the SAS experience might be grandfathered or might have to showcase that number 18. And then other people who don't go to SAS could, you know, credential in some of these other areas. I mean, I, I personally think that's okay just because in working with you know the six seven people on the steering committee i know that we all have areas of expertise that maybe we don't all have i mean there are go-to things that i would go to to each person on that steering committee for that i don't feel as competent in so i don't think it's going to, i think it'll add to the rdl network as long as we you know, really look at this from a credentialing standpoint to say this is where if everybody ends up getting credentialed in all seven areas, then we're right back to where we started and we're really not showcasing ex any expertise. So I think there is some benefit in having people who have specific buckets that we can go to that can definitely help districts, especially if there's not anyone in their ESC SST who has that area. However, um, the only flip side I see to that, Jackie, I think you're right. Um, the flip side may be, let's just say somebody does get all seven buckets. Like, I mean, this is going to be hopefully a good learning opportunity for our RDLs even to say like, hey, you know, I feel okay about graduation, but I really want to invest the time, resources, whatever, to become an expert. Um, and so it would be a good learning opportunity, I think, for others to maybe get involved in some of these modules and refine their skills, maybe. Totally agree. And I wasn't saying that we couldn't get all seven. I just don't think it can be a checkbox. Yeah, exactly. I, I, agree. I agree. Yeah, it's not a requirement to be in the network. So what? To have all seven. But I, but I could see some people in the network, I guess, on the flip yeah. side is that, you know, some people have that growth mindset of like oh, one sure. and two. Oh, they and definitely I, will. <laughs> yeah. So, which is good. I mean, I think we have to feel good about that and that people would actually have the opportunity. You know, if I want to know more about, you know, uh, data to serve exceptional children, I really could dig into that. I may not, though, because someone else here at our ESC is really the expert and an RDL. So, so one of the questions I have is um, committing yourself to trying to be credentialed in all of these strands or whichever ones that make sense based on how your ESC or SST is organized is a time is a time commitment. So, how is this being presented to, for example, OESCA? that leadership organization for ESCs so that they under, understand or view the value of having people in their organizations that possess these credentials so that those people can serve districts. I mean, so, type of process. Great, great question, Kathy. You know, in, with right now with EVOS, there, there's a couple of bars that you have to jump. One is uh, the ESC or SSC has to commit some money, yeah. right? I mean, that's one part of it. Uh, and they also have to commit people's time to go through this. And that's not inconsequential. Uh, you know, and we might make it, we need to think about what the bar is that we're, what, that we're trying to set there, not just in terms of the, of the difficulty of the, of the different, uh, those 18 different uh, 
pieces in there, but just what is it going to take for people to get through that sort of uh, activity? And also, who is doing the training? I, you know, this is this is uh, important because you know uh, <clears throat> I think somebody already brought up why well, a lot of people know about OTES. Uh, is there anything more to be learned and who's going to be teaching to me, uh, basically, is is what this is all about. Uh, that particular one, uh, you know, we, we have a lot to discuss with the folks in, in uh, our offices that work with OTES and uh, how that would be set up. But I could I could very well see that there are current uh, RDLs who would you know, be part of the, even do part of the training for that. Uh, question, Matt. Um, what is the steering committee's role in this? Um, I guess long-term thinking, thinking about this RFP, like, can we apply for it? Or how, you know, maybe we were written into this grant? Are we... You, evaluators of it do you see what i'm saying yeah. like like so is it gonna make, be a conflict if we apply to participate before we get to that part let me just point out the first part of your question which is what is the steering committee's role the steering committee is written in to the grant as being a feedback mechanism for this in other words this discussion is part of that feedback okay. mechanism. so we want to make sure that you're on board with this framework uh, in not just generally, but in in some amount of detail, uh, and and any suggestions that you have, we really want to know. That doesn't have to happen at this moment, but we want to be able to have this conversation enough that you can start to see how this works, and say, well, wait a minute, maybe there's some piece of it that that I was thinking about that uh, you would that doesn't really fit in here. Uh, you're mentioning right off about uh, well, what about early childhood, right? Well, that's sort of outside the scope of this, but we want to be able to to add, you know, that ought to be easy to add on as another credential. Phase two or something. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I guess that's where I was coming from, Matt, too, when I initially looked at this and I was going for it. I think you almost need layers within here. Like I think of what like Google does for their micro, micro credentials. There's there's like a level one that gives you a, a quote unquote, a smattering of various things. And then from there, people kind of choose and go in deeper onto various things. Because I think to a certain extent, if you're going to call somebody an RDL, they need to have some knowledge about, um, dare to say, all of these things. I don't know that that's necessarily fair. Maybe it's six out of seven, whatever it is. And then from there, you kind of become specific. And because where this is going to be coming into an issue is, of course, job functionality. I like it. I mean, in terms of Christy, I mean, she might have a person who's an RDL, but can't do OTES because that's just not what their function is at the end of the day. And I, I think it's important, though, that that person still has some little understanding of OTES because, as Chris mentioned earlier, we want to create this comprehensive, um, you know, position of, of student accountability or not, I guess staff and student accountability to make sure that they're all growing at the end of the day. Uh, OK, so the the layering certainly is not built into this this uh, thing right now. And I think that we have to, we would have to think through a little bit more about how that would work out. Uh, I love that question, idea. One, though. one question. Well, one question I would have is that and this is a discussion that we would have with the contractor after after that first that the contractor determined is, you know, what would constitute levels uh, for any of these things? Maybe some of them, it's very obvious. Uh, for others, it may not be very obvious what those levels might be. Well, Matt, and I guess what I was saying was is that it's not so much about, I think the levels aren't defined about the levels within each of the strands. I think that there's a level one that assumes that, and I'm just making this concrete, that you have some significant knowledge about value add. You have some significant knowledge about state analysis and whatever those components are. And then level two can be a lot of these other things that you have on this chart. And then that's where you get to decide, you know what, I'm gonna go for the micro-credentialing in um, you know, early warning systems, and then I'm gonna go through all of those pieces and parts. Well, I could, I could see very easily that uh, we could expand the notion that that number one has. See, what, what I, I think we had in mind with that is to make sure that, that everybody has sort of a basic understanding of what, you know, what is EMIS, what are the other what what are the processes 
that go into collecting the data, not to become experts in EMIS, but rather to be able to answer questions that come up all the time for people when you say, well, you know, what, how did you end up, how did we end up with this data? And maybe it's really not so much anything about what kids are doing, but simply because the process got messed up in the, in, you know, as it moved along and you have the wrong data. I mean, you should See, be able to- That to me- that, That's that sort of what- to me Go ahead, Brian. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. It was kind of fitting out there. That to me is almost the level two, because if I don't even know what the data is, what the data is, i.e., the value added or the state reporting system, I don't even know what question to ask to even go and think about that it's EMS. Right, but but that's again, this is just sort of basic stuff that you'd have to have, but to get you now, that in itself wouldn't get you a credential. Right. So wow. I think another piece to think about with this too is like what's the the micro credentials and the the pieces that we've written into the SLDS grant, and what is actually a bigger discussion that is outside of the grant, but is about how you become part of the network or how you become an RDL, and so those discussions should not necessarily be up to the contractor for the SLDS grant, but about what we envision as we formalize the network and then is that something that like the department is responsible for creating that high level um training of here's what the department does here's what rdls do here's some of the basics about data and here are the different systems and you go through that training and then you become eligible to take any micro credential leading to any credential but like there would be a required training as a first step right and that's a little bit like I think it's hard to separate, but I do think it's outside of the SLDS grant because we did not write it in that way, right? But we could think about these things in tandem as we formalize the network. Right. This, well, Shelby, this is very, I mean, it, it's pretty loose right now. And we could, we could have, that would be the discussion we would have with the contractor. So what goes into that number one, for example? And now Brian mentioned data analysis. Just understanding data analysis. I'm not sure exactly what that means at the moment, but you know, just leave it alone as this is the, the basic understanding that everybody should have if they're going to be an R, do RDL work. Local report card. But then if right. you're really digging in, maybe that's where you go a little deeper. Well, like uh, say, right. report, report card 101. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. I, this, this is a now let me let me press this just a little bit because the other thing you said brian was value added and again is you know what level of value added would you expect in that kind of thing it would, i am assuming for the moment that you don't mean that everyone has to go to sas not necessarily go to SAS, but what I would argue is, is that what's in the value added 101 and the 102, which is kind of like the first day and a half of of the of the training at SAS, that to me would be the the information I would think we would want people to have an awareness of. They might not be proficient at, they might not be able to run activities on it, but they should have some type of knowledge in that in that level one component. It's kind of like the idea of like what in the Google micro, micro credential, everybody knows something about Gmail. So that they, they quantify that and they put, these are the skills you have to demonstrate in level one. Now, if you wanna go and get a full micro credential in Gmail, which would be like strand six, these are all the things that we're gonna have you do, or these are all the things you're gonna to have to show proficiency in, and that's level two. But when you get to that level two option, you get to choose your pathway. You might go to Gmail, you might go to Google Docs, you might go to whatever one you want to be the micro credentialing in, but everybody still has some basic understanding of Gmail. Okay, so again, that you know the bucket there is that it's sort of a catch-all right now, which is listed as number one. That number one, which is you'll notice, is it, for all of the credentials, that is where we're putting that that first level of understanding that you would you would require for any credential. Correct. And is that consistent it, with it's, what you're saying? Yeah, it's almost like the introductory level. Like, here's the introduction. Like, everybody's got to go through this and can demonstrate this first before you can even go into some of the deeper things. The like, difference I, I think of growth and achievement, right? Exactly Those right. Like, exactly. 
like exactly what kind of what you were taking off, Christy, like I would expect everybody to have some understanding of the state report card in level one, but I wouldn't expect them to be able to do the item analysis behind the achievement measure at the level one. And the level two, I would expect them to do right ORS, all of that fun stuff. Uh, and that's fun. The EMS, yeah. Okay. Okay. There's, well, first of all, I, I get what you're saying. I, I think that that's part of a conversation that we would start to have immediately after we have a contractor. And again, your role is to, to keep that conversation going, not just with us, but also with the contractor. Now, of course, this gets a little bit complicated because after all, some of you might be part of the contractor team. So I, I just want to leave that there, but th but we can work through that. Um, but again, when when you ask the question, what's the role of the steering committee? That that's where it really fits in, and it's ongoing. Uh, okay, so I, this has been very helpful to me, certainly uh, in getting a sense, and I got some good ideas that that came out of this. Uh, anybody else have anything that you want to add? or say or question right now. I mean, I I think again, uh, this has some implications for ESCs and SSTs generally uh, as they as we play this out. And I'm not sure how that's going to all run smoothly or not. So we'll see. I would just I would just ask to make sure that when we're looking at this, so if I look at number two on our micro credentials about local equitable access planning process and it goes with that strand one of local local equitable access to excellent educators and analysis tool one of the very first pieces of data that i would want to look at is my level my effectiveness level of the teachers that i have in my building and so making sure that that's part of that training so there would be overlap whether we're talking about at that second level or that third level that brian was talking about with those credentials where there's going to be overlap because you can't I don't know, in my opinion, it's like you have to look at effectiveness level of teachers to see are we equitable in our access to all of our, our students having equitable access to high quality teachers, high effective teachers. And see, to me, Suzette, I 100% agree with you. That to me is almost like, I'm going to call it level three. You almost need something at the beginning and something at the end to bring that all back together, because if not, you have exactly what we have going on in our state where we have silos of these different things and nobody's bringing them back together, which is why that series that we had built last year was so powerful to many yeah. people because we started connecting those things. All right. So let me let me let me throw that out to that and then I want to move on to uh, the next item on the agenda. But I just want to throw out that again, I think it's important to say to yourself, does this mean that some credentials are prerequisites for others? Yes. Yeah. Yes. OK, so I mean, and again, not a discussion for right now, but when we get a contractor, that's the, that's sort of important for us to be talking about. Uh, okay. Allie, yeah, one I, final I, I, sorry, one final question just to clarify. So once the contractor is uh, selected and the process for developing this begins, is it is the role of the steering committee going to be that during that process at certain points, some of what they're creating will or uh, proposing will be brought back to the steering committee for feedback at that time to say, yeah, this looks good like or yeah, I, change this. I don't necessarily think of this as having to be a meeting. Uh, we might want you to review some things and, and comment and, and get back to us. I mean, you know, we haven't had that that conversation in depth, but I think that, you know, Ali, Crit, Shelby, chime in you here. You all are listed as a primary stakeholder in the RFP. <laughs> You're there. You can't get it. You can't <laughs> escape. <laughs> Hey, Shelby, when you say primary stakeholder, can you tell me what that means in this case? That was Allie. Sorry. That was Allie. Oh, I'm sorry, Allie. I apologize. Um, the feds just require us to list all of our stakeholders to the process. Um, and obviously, the RDL steering committee is one of the main stakeholders. Got it. OK. All right. Uh, OK, I think we've about as much as uh, we need. Are there any other questions about the SLDS grant in general? Uh, concerns that you want us to think about right now? 
Hey, man, I got a question for you. Um, so would it be possible, uh, no, thinking about how this functions, could, those, could the entity that's doing the work, could they be cross CSCs or does it have to be one entity? Say that one more time. Like, let's say that, that we wanted to build a team. Let's say that Christy and I wanted to partner up and, I don't know, write all these things or whatever, however it's set up. Can it be cross CSC or does it have to be yeah. one location? Yeah. No. Yeah. Allowed and encouraged. Uh, so it's allowed and encouraged to go ahead and do yep. multiple ESCs <laughs> if we wanted to. Okay. Yep. It's a big yeah. job. I think Kathy asked this earlier, but I'm not sure I heard the answer. So is it going out to every ESC or is it going out through OSCA? Well, we'll go out through uh, DAS, I think, doesn't it, Allie? I don't mean through. I guess I mean to. Yeah. Yeah. It'll go out. It will go out to. It will go out to all the ESCs. Uh, how that mechanism is going to be done? I think we have to have a conversation with Craig. What would be, what would facilitate it the the best? But the the it's written such that the ESCs are the only bidders. Okay. Yeah. Only possible bidders. Okay. So no other entity that no is. Other entity. And, yes, and the ESCs can subcontract. So okay. if they want to partner with a university on a certain topic or, you know, some other group, they can do that. All right. So we've alluded to this next topic already uh, said and, and now think of this in, in greater terms, you know, given the SLDS grant and the credentialing, but uh, we really do want to create a more formalized, coherent structure the, uh, for this network. And Shelby, why don't you take it away? <laughs> All right. Let, let me see if I can get. OK. Are we good seeing PowerPoint? Uh, so. Um, so. Uh, one proposal for the structure. Um, a lot of this has come up in our discussion for the SLDS grant. Uh, a lot of this has come up um, from a proposal from all of you from the steering committee about how to formalize um, filling vacancies on the steering committee and moving forward some of that role and expectations. Um, so we've had a lot of, of good discussions internally and I, and I know with this group and so we wanted to kind of put one formal structure on the table and just kind of get us started. We so, don't see anything. You're not seeing it? Okay. I, I can see it. I'm seeing I it. it. Oh man. I can. I can oh, then it. maybe, so I, it says can't display content. There was a problem displaying content. Okay. Is that just what? my team then? It could just be me. Maybe that. I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try stopping and starting again. Hold on. Like people again. <laughs> one second. Does anybody else have any trouble? No. No, I was okay. Yes. Yeah, I can follow along. Right here. <laughs> All right, and I can email it out afterwards too. Okay. Um. All right. We might be back in the same way. Um. Okay, let me. Sorry, I'll just do one. No, nope. I can't multitask that well. Okay, I will send it out afterwards. I'm sorry for. Um, so the feedback that we've gotten that has prompted some of these discussions is really from that needs assessment that Brittany emailed out and that Chris has been talking about where there's interest in expanding the, the work and the network. Um, knowing that that folks capacity matters a lot and so having clear descriptions and expectations is really important. Um, that was some feedback from the districts of just knowing kind of what the role of RDLs is, what to expect, how to contact folks. Um, there seemed to definitely be a call for a benefit of having a formal structure is a little bit easier to understand and explain. That's a little bit clearer for folks. There's a clarification of roles. Um, we know there's some differences in those SST and ESC or district roles for folks in the network. Um, 
So really just trying to pull some of that together in in one um, example. Uh, if some of you could have heard some of the conversations as we were working on the SLDS grant, um, you would have heard us throwing around a lot of different groups and confusing ourselves because there are network members, there's the department, there's regional data leads that are SSTs, there's regional data leads that are staffed in ESCs, we have um, folks who've gone to, to SAS training, and so technically they are um, regional data leads. They work for districts or have moved to districts or have moved from districts to ESCs. We have committees, we have a steering committee, we have an internal leadership team at the department, and we have the RDL leadership team. It's a lot of different groups, um, all kind of focused on somewhat different things, somewhat the same thing. So. Um, my my attempt here was to look at formalizing the network name. I'll explain that in a little bit. We've got some overlap in a different state initiative. Um, so we have to be a little bit more specific as we think about formalizing the name of the whole network. Uh, thinking about the clarity of membership type. Um, and then what I think is kind of a different shift from the working structure that we've had or or maybe perspective for some folks is really thinking about the steering committee as the executive committee. Um, so kind of the top tier of the committees of the network and that there would be an application process or a nominating process for those members on the steering committee. Um, which was part of the proposal that that you all had sent to us that that really fed into this discussion. So um, I have tried to take some of the, the graphics and, and knowledge and explanation that you guys have been using, that the team has been using to explain the RDL network. And it's really looking at, um, so creating this Ohio Education Data Professionals Network, um, a little bit longer of a name, and we can discuss that. That's somewhat up for discussion. Um, the Ohio Data Network is a, a big the governor's office and some some other folks and so it's going to get complicated if we don't specify what we're doing um and then you have all of the network members um within that you also have network members where there are specific qualifications and eligibility to be an actual regional data lead um and i'll we'll dig into this a little bit and once you get into the regional data leads as well, we have our standing committees. So, you know, right now we've got the resource development, higher education, our resource for special ed data, um, educational and advocacy. And so you've got your committees and then you have your steering committee or your executive committee that is going to really be that um, feedback mechanism for the department, but also really the provider of direction for the network. So if I think about um, a network member um, who doesn't have any other kind of qualification, so network members are, you know, those that include um, ODE staff, higher ed staff, maybe district staff, um, interested individuals in data training and networking. Um, they can be trained in SAS, they can be credentialed in the upcoming credentials. But we have, um, I think in the past, the description has really been the the difference there is these are staff who are not providing regional support. Um, and this is all, again, draft proposal for feedback. But, you know, we have network members and we don't want to discourage anyone from um, from being a part of the network and having training opportunities and getting on the same page to be able to support um, their schools and, and classrooms or teachers or if it is a teacher, you know, um, but there's just a difference in that membership type. Then you have your regional data leads, um, which, you know, you're also a network member, um, but you're trained in SAS or any of the other upcoming credentials and you provide regional supports through your positions with the SSTs or ESCs. Um, I know there's some district staff and agreements with ESCs and SSTs, so that can all be um, kind of ironed out and clarified, um, but for ease of conversation. 
then you have your network standing committees. And so committees can include network members or RDLs. Um, I do think the committees should be reviewed every few years uh, to determine the continued relevance, uh, make sure that the purpose and the membership, everyone is kind of recommitting to that activity. I think happens now, but just making sure that there's a bit of a formalized process for that and that committees would have then a chair and a vice chair or co-chairs like I know exists now. Um, and this is where I was thinking it makes a lot of sense to think through, you know, should there be a qualitative data committee or um, like qualitative data and measurement uh, or an impact committee that is that is formalizing that process for collecting the stories and sharing out the impact of the network. Um, some of those things might you know, the focus might transition every couple of years, depending on um, what's happening with the network, what's happening at the state level, where kind of focus might need to be. Um, all right, and then the steering or executive committee. Um, so this is that kind of top leadership, um, providing feedback to the department, providing net um, direction for the network. Um, and the position comes with a little more formality. Um, you would apply or be nominated for vacant positions. Um, you know, there's priority to have regional representation across the state. You would have to have, you know, support from your employer or supervisor. Some of those pieces of that formal um, process that, that you all had submitted to us would really go into this and, and kind of is the, the next step. Um, so, so as I was thinking about this last night, the, the next steps is definitely for us to sit and kind of discuss some of the formalization, but formally writing up the different types of membership, um, formalizing that process or expectations nomination process for the executive committee or the steering committee. Um, and then I have question marks for anyone else's ideas about what the next steps might be. Um, and so a, a couple additional thoughts and then just want to open it up for discussion and um, and I will send the slides to to Suzette, I think is is who couldn't if right. OK, shaking your head. Um, so, I mean, I as I'm thinking about this, I want to build a structure. Um, we're you know, we would ease in and transition to any of this. It would be maintaining the group that we have now um, and like transitioning longer term into the more formalized application nomination process moving forward with any vacancies or, or that type of thing. Um, but really trying to make sure that we have clear membership types and clear opportunities for both our existing leaders and experts to be providing that direction um, and mentorship a little bit. Making sure that there's opportunities for new and up and coming leaders across the state to join in some of these opportunities and get the experience and um, and kind of help make sure that we have like good succession planning and growth across the state with the network. Um, so that was one thing I was thinking about. Um, we definitely need to think through how we might need to either define or um, for the SST and ESC roles, if there's differences in those types, um, that might just be, you know, I was thinking as you as you were all talking earlier, having kind of best practices or um, models of how those relationships work across the state. And I don't think there's one right way for the relationship to work. I think everyone is is in a slightly unique position, but you may see your your um, kind of context in an in another person's working relationship. And so having some examples or models might help with the definition of those pieces versus being very rigid about what the difference is between them. Um, so those are those are all of my thoughts on on the formal structure. And I, I know it's it's very high level kind of to get us started so that we can start putting in the details if we agree to um, we have to agree to the bigger picture and then we'll start working on the, the more detailed pieces. So I will email this to Suzette and then I'll email it after to everyone else too, but. Um, Brittany, Brittany already sent it out, Shelby. Oh, perfect. Email. Uh, okay, so. 
as, as Shelby said, this is for discussion now, but also ongoing discussion. There's a lot of pieces in here, and we certainly want you to digest this uh, to, to be provide some thoughtful uh, re response. But what do you think for now? Could you go back to the steering committee uh, where the bubble kind of expands? Mm -hmm. Yes. That one? Yeah. Um, it is an, I, it's, Is this role like, I mean, is this insinuating it's like an advisory type role? Is it a, do you know what I mean? I'm just wondering, is the title, um, does the title sum up our roles in the work, I guess, is that, I, yeah. are y'all following me? I, yeah, and I would love, so the thing I kind of struggle with is like, how to make sure that we're defining like we come to this group with everything mm -hmm. and that's the purpose right yeah. now th throughout the year i do envision the steering committee having joint meetings with the co-chairs or chairs of the other standing committees so there is coordination amongst all of the committees and it's not like they it's not like the other committees or anyone in the network reports to you, but like the steering committee provides the leadership of the organization, like of the network is how I picture it. And and I don't know that it's been discussed that way in the past, but like as I look back and think about our behavior and how we interact, like that's how our behavior suggests, right? Like the steering committee helps with the convening and setting the direction of the convening and getting folks involved in that. We're coming to you with the RFP and the SLDS, which is truly the like direction and vision of the network. Um, and so that's where I like, we are coming to you as that leadership structure kind of representing perspectives of the network. Yeah, a lot, just some clarification here. A lot of the things that we've been coming to you with is because you've been available as the key group to provide feedback. And, uh, you know, for example, uh, the convening started off as perhaps we ought to have a committee, but it was difficult to bring together another committee. So you became uh, pretty much involved in, in that as we move forward. So a lot of these things are, uh, have been very ad hoc and what we're really trying to establish is what are the things that you ought to be doing as this executive or, or steering committee or however it's called so uh, again your feedback here is critical to thinking through what you think your role ought to be uh, and i think like the one another thing that prompted and then i'll i will shut up and let you guys share your thoughts was like the proposal you had sent to us about formalizing the steering committee was about like an application process and like there should be interviews there should be experience required you know there were expectations that are far higher for this committee than any other committee is just are you interested in doing this can you commit the time cool come on board we want everyone right and so like that level of formalization kind of I, th I think it was like organically becoming <laughs> the, the leadership team, but okay, I'm gonna officially mute and turn over to everyone else for thoughts. That means you guys have to say something about it. <laughs> it definitely does. <laughs> okay, Suzette's typing and I'm gonna send. I still, I don't have it in an email either. I have no idea what you guys are looking at besides someone sent me a structure of the picture. Okay. See. I'm sorry. You're and I, our district. No, you're good. I just sent it to you. So I'm not sure what happened. I guess, I guess I need to understand. Or actual teams downloaded on your laptop. 
Oh, I use it. I have a I have the desktop app. I just okay. I just, Suzette, I, I, I just forward you it again. So, no, Suzette, the PowerPoint should be in your email now. Okay. And Jackie, I think you were. Yeah, I was just wondering. There's a lot of what you have here, in in prettier colors, is is really like you said what we kind of submitted in our proposal. But I, I guess I need to understand or just clarify yeah. what other or different or future expectations, maybe just the difference, are the expectations than what we've been doing thus far yeah. compared to what you're thinking about moving forward? Yeah. I, and I think me, I would add on to that. I'm sorry. Yeah. I would add on to that, Jackie, that is it, is it an advisory role or is it a group that's designed to make decisions? Yeah. yeah. That, that's I, I think where I was going with that advice yeah. on the. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about that one together in a second. I think, Jackie, to your first questions, for me, I was imagining like this is what I already think you guys are doing. <laughs> okay. But I don't know that we have framed it this way. Um, and so like in discussion, it was more like, well, we go to them for feedback and, you know, it's a good diverse group and they have this representation. I'm like, well, you know, I, I think it's more formalizing and making it clear because okay. then I do think as you start to make sure that you have representation or fill vacancies, there is some kind of clout to why there might be an application or nomination process and why you would expect there to be certain experience to join this group, you know, because you're holding a, a little bit higher bar for participation and approval from supervisors and that sort of thing. So I do think it's exactly what you've been doing, but we're just being clear about that role. Um, I think on the decision advisory, I would love to know like what you guys think about that or what types of decisions or, um, you know, examples from the past that might help think through what the what the difference there is. I'm not I mean, and again, I'm speaking for myself, but I'm not so sure <clears throat> that's as important as once it is defined that it's carried through. Yeah, so Agreed. if if really advisory, then we understand that we are we're giving some advice or some opinion or some with some basis for why we think that's an important suggestion yeah. and that can be part of what happens or not. But if it's, you know, decision making, I think that our role becomes even more formalized. Yeah. And more important and with more accountability, but also with more legitimacy. If I'm yeah. saying that correctly. Yeah, that makes sense. Sorry, that's yeah. that's an important distinction. Yeah. Advisory <laughs> versus decision making. Jackie, executive do you have committees. Mind? You guys, executive an committee example. sounds more decision making to me. Hmm. Can yeah. you guys give an example of um, what what decision. changes in a decision making? Like what what kind of decisions would you be making? Uh, like here might be here might be one example. I don't know if this is a relevant example or not, but I, I think back of through our history is like a Matt came to us at one point in time and said, hey, do you guys want to have a fall meeting or not have a fall meeting? Okay. Uh, just one random example that I thought of. I, I don't know that there's more to it than that. I mean, for all I know, we could be playing a game of semantics right now. It might be. I, I think it just goes like, you know, are we keeping true with the grassroots and like we're advising and helping kind of contribute? Are we, uh, yeah. or, or sorry, are we keeping with the grassroots and we are more executive in that kind of role? Or is it, oh, you know, ODE maybe has, has more um, parameters and we advise on different materials on different like do you know what i mean mm -hmm. yeah and i think the hard thing like, i know like it 
it still feels very much co-designed, right? Like mm -hmm. I'm not going to just create a structure and then say, hey, this is our structure. Like we are co-designing it, but to some degree, right? Like I'm not co-designing it with the whole network at this point. We want to iron it out with all of you. And so in that way, it's like both, right? Like it's advising and deciding. I think bigger picture and long-term and, and Chris, I would, I think you're still on, but I'm not actually sure. Um, you know, he had talked about like funding in the future of like long term, if we can make a case for this network and the value and the impact, is there dedicated funding to support efforts of training in the network and, and the work that everyone's doing? And in that case, right, the network needs to become even more formal because there's going to be funding involved. And so in that way, there might be more decisions that are made. And so I'm not sure, I don't, to Jackie's point, like, I think right now it's kind of like the squishy in between where if, if saying it's advisory feels better and we're co-designing that, that that's fine, but we're also kind of laying down the groundwork for an easier transition. If we need to flip a switch to being more formal, like even more formal than this, like we had grassroots, we're kind of growing up. If we need to flip a switch to something even more formal because funding becomes involved or something like that in a different way, like we've got a, a frame already set. It shall be like another like example of something that could happen down the road. Let's say that there's another large grant opportunity that the network wants to apply for, right? Yeah. Not necessarily the department applying, but let's say that you know any number of things that the that the network itself might want to apply for having some sort of more formal structure and figuring out how that could happen because i, I think we, we we're spending sometimes i think we spend a lot of time dealing with these kinds of logistics and who's doing you know <laughs> as we're sort of even struggling with now i think you know me part of that long-term vision is ironing those things out so that those become easier down the road too yeah and Shelby, I liked how you kind of explained that in terms of it is a, and could be a transition. Yeah. So if it's, you know, if this started with an idea, you know, three or four years ago, and now it's kind of morphing into something different, we just all need to be on the same page with that. Yeah. That I think that's sometimes where the issue comes because it's like, mm -hmm. wait, how, where did that come from? So just yeah. having that kind of discussion about here's where it started here's where we might be i liked your squishy in the middle yes. and then transitioning but let's always be clear about that yeah 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 well, and if there's application process people need to know what they're applying you know so like right. what are they committing right. to <laughs> applying to be in this it in, indicates it's a very formalized formalized process with a with a true expectation for yeah. what the members are going to do. So I think it's important that we sort of define what those things are. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is Tammy. I'm gonna throw out something else as far as the decision-making versus advisory capacity. Um, yeah. Just looking at the SLDS grant, for example, one of the deliverables in outcome four was to contract with an Ohio ESC to deliver regional trainings to district and school personnel. So um, I'm assuming that, you know, was written into the grant. So now that's going to be something that when this RFP goes out, may be part of that RFP. But as a regional training, that sounds like it will be one ESC. So let's just, you know, play, for example, if the ESC of Central Ohio got the, uh, the RFP service contract. So mm -hmm. would they maybe out delivering these trainings to every region across the state? No, and, and just, and Tammy, just remember the trainings that we're talking about with the SLDS are trainings of, say, RDLs, not trainings of school people. Okay, well, that's not the way it's written into the grant. It says to district and school personnel. So that was where Matt, I was Yeah, Matt, can you clarify that? Yeah, yeah. So, so, I mean, RDLs themselves are uh, district okay. and school personnel. You know, the net, think of the network again. Uh, so, but the idea here is sort of a train the trainers uh, that they're not going out, they're providing, uh, say, training to you so that you can go out and do the same kind of work. I mean, that, that's what your expertise is being built up on. Sure, uh, and I understand that, but in the grant, it looks like that's point one, and then there's another point two that sort of reads a little differently. 
and I mean, that's fine if that's the way it is. I guess in the advisory yeah. versus decision making, you know, what I would be thinking might come up would be if the uh, executive or steering committee said, you know, that's not really the way things work in our rollout of information. We really don't think it should go that direction. You know, yeah. I could see that in an advisory yeah. capacity right. saying, oh, thank you for your advice, but we're still going to do it this way. Yeah, you didn't have any advice on the grant on getting the grant. That's for sure. What you do have advice on is how to interpret the RFP as we move forward. Yeah, I mean, like that's a sticky situation for us with you guys because you you are also eligible to bid on right. the RFP. So, you know, we we had to make some decisions there about how much involvement, you know, now that the RFP is written and, you know, you know we, we had to make all the decisions as to what was going to go into the RFP. Now that once it hits the streets and you guys start working with it and, and bidding on it, then, you know, you will have more decision making authority and advising um, once, but, you know. Yeah. But I, I just one other start. thought that, I, that I'll add to that too, Tammy. And again, uh, to me, for me, this is sort of there's sort of two parts. There's sort of one dealing with the there's sort of a little bit of dealing with the messiness that's in front of us. Ideally, in my world, let's say that two years from now that there's a new SLDS grant. Um, ideally, that RFP would have been designed to say a network may bid for mm -hmm. certain things, right? Um, we're not currently there, and you know it couldn't have been written that way because we're not there yet. Uh, but but wouldn't it have been nice if we get to the point where there's a grant opportunity and it can be said, okay, well we we're looking for a network who can provide X, Y, and Z. And oh, by the way, we have a network in place that can do that. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. All right. Well. I um, and being a good, hopefully, facilitator of time. I know we've just got about um, 10, 11 minutes left, and there were a couple of other updates and items for discussion. So I do want to hand back to Matt. Um, I will share this PowerPoint out with the whole group um, after, and feel free to we can exchange um, ideas and, and feedback and suggestions through email. Um, we can set up additional time to talk through it. Feel free to reach out, but. Um, I do think the next steps would be I can kind of write this up more formally. Um, we can kind of dig into some questions or details and, and try to keep moving this process along in between any um, group meetings. Um, how does that sound with everyone? Okay. Good. Good. Yeah, that's that's fine. And I, just for clarification purposes, would you guys mind if we as a steering committee got together and just kind of... Uh, <laughs> talked out a lot about some of these things because I know many of us have questions. Helpful, Brian. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. okay. Thank you. So uh, just a couple quick things that we need to talk about. One very brief uh, status of the future of SAS, uh, the EVOS training. Just so you know, uh, you know, we've been going through this and really wanted to have some training. Obviously, the, the pandemic has caused havoc with that. Uh, we at last tried to think of some, we got some dates in the spring. Uh, I'm almost ready to pull the plug on that. Uh, I mean, I, I don't think that uh, SAS is still wa wa waiting to find out whether they're going to be open to, to have be able to do something like that. They think they are, but I, I think that uh, the reality is that uh, this spring might not work out for enough people uh, to be traveling. Uh, so that's part hey, of it. So, uh, wait, just Can wait. I ask you a question? Sure. Okay. Um, my question is this, is that uh, granted, everybody wants to experience the M&M containers down there, but is there something, if there's enough need uh, that would prohibit them from doing it virtually? I know it's not the exact same experience, but at least it gets people the information because my concern now is this will have been delayed for over a year then. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, this goes back to the whole issue of what constitutes a credential. We haven't called it a credential, but the essence of it right now is that is the only credential that we have. And 
do you want would you rather have the ability to have people have a uh, EVOS training light and uh, then what? So, I, I mean, I, I think that there's some possibilities that we could look into, but I just want to let you also know that we are looking at, in fact, dates in the uh, in this fall of uh, 2021. The only I, I guess uh, I. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say when you said cheating, I guess I don't know what you mean by I that. Like, cheating. oh, maybe I misheard it. I, I guess I was looking at it from, or, or I guess your phrasing of light, uh, lights, uh, EVAS or however you, I guess to me is well, what would be different about what people would go and see versus what they would do virtually? Well, I, I, part of it is what the capacity that SAS has for doing the kind of training they want to do. Got it. And, and so they would have to come up with a different training uh, protocol to be able to do something that that they would be comfortable with. Uh, they've been pushing back very hard on on that idea in the past. So I, you know, I'm, I'm I, I, we have to balance off the difference between, you know, can the department realistically expend some more of its of its resources to do something that maybe we only think would be half worthwhile. The other thing related to that that I think would be sacrificed if we did it virtually was the great opportunity for us to network the whole time we were there. I mean, there were a lot of very productive conversations that went on over dinner, over lunch, over breakfast. There were you know, no distractions. Back and forth, so we'd miss on that. That, that was, was the benefit of there was no distraction in anything yeah. outside <laughs> distractions coming in. So, so we, as I said, Thus far, we have not really pursued that as a as a as a good option. Uh, obviously, and and then as we start to develop the SLDS grant proposal with multiple uh, credentials, we sort of ease the problem. The problem that Brian that you raise in the short run is certainly one that is uh, is an issue, and maybe we need to think creatively about how we might get around that. In other words, there are people who should be RDLs right now, who we've not listed. And what do we do about those people? I mean, Matt, I guess, and maybe I'm advocating for this because I think of what everybody has had to do in the last eight months about having to move OTUS training online, having to move value-added trainings online, having to do all those things. I think it's so important that those people have the opportunity to get that information. So I would hope the department is pushing staff to figure out what is, what can be done to ensure that those trainings can happen. But I also agree with Kathy that there is definitely a con of losing some of that camaraderie, but I think there's ways to do that. I, I think they just have to get creative. Uh, again, I, I think this is the difference between getting people, this is that level one that we were talking about before, getting people up to speed on knowing something about value added, which is presumably something that a lot of you could do with others. You didn't have to do it through SAS. I, I, I raised that issue. Um, sure. All right. So anyway, I, I just want to, we'll, we'll sort of think through this a little bit more and uh, see if there's some something that seems worthwhile that we could propose. Second thing, I sent out uh, dates in January. I'd also like to throw out two more uh, dates just because um, I'm afraid we're not going to get enough for everybody to get a good participation for a meeting with the entire group, including the eight other individuals. Uh, so the two other dates and times that I've got available that we could possibly do would be February 3rd in the morning and February 5th in the morning. Morning being about 9 to 1130. Uh, Suzette and Brian, the the flexibility that you asked for, uh, we could certainly accommodate for those other times. But nevertheless, uh, what I'd like to do is end up with about uh, hopefully at least five possibilities that we could throw out for a, a doodle poll for everybody to see who we could get into a, a meeting with the uh, in the I don't know what we now call it, but the enhanced leadership of, uh, of the group, including co-chairs of the committees. The agenda for that meeting 
will also be some of the things that we've discussed today, although more in, in a reporting mode uh, than these extended discussions. But included in that, I would also say that we need to have a good discussion about the value of the committees themselves. You know, what have you been doing? What, in some cases, nothing, but that also has to do with the pandemic. Uh, what could you be doing? What should we think of the committees, how the committees could fit in to this uh, expanded uh, thinking about the RDL network? Uh, those are the ideas that I have. Uh, I'd like to get ideas from you for an agenda. Uh, please send them in. But um, in the meantime, uh, Christy and Jackie, make sure that you send me some responses on the dates and times that we have. Working on and, it now. Uh, OK, me too. I, 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 I can't, I can't, process, I can't process and, and discuss at the same time, especially since I only have three minutes. So sure that I get those. Uh, everybody add again, February. And I, I'm putting nine to eleven thirty. I just want to let you know that we have some flexibility a uh, half an hour either way on on these times. Uh, February 5th, 9 to 1130. So add those in and, and just get me your feedback. I'll uh, compile that, come up with a list that uh, that looks as doable as possible, because I'd really like to get all seven you uh, seven of you in that meeting. Uh, but we also need to make sure that it works for the, uh, for the, the uh, others. And uh, again, if you have thoughts that you really want to have discussed at the uh, meeting, let me know those as well. So this meeting, Matt, that you're trying to get together, this is for us, the steering committee, and the committee chairs of the other mm -hmm. subcommittees. Is that what it is? Yes. Okay. Do you, do you anticipate at this meeting that we'll have some structure things to share as far as like what Shelby was formalizing from our group, things like that? I, I Shelby, Shelby put, did this and I say, you know, uh, the more we can get into this as, as, done, as a done deal, <laughs> the better. So, you know, your discussions among yourselves yeah. and getting some feedback to us will be very important. Feedback to Shelby in particular. <sighs> Yeah. What's the timeline of the RFP? Uh, well, as Ali said, we, we are hoping again, I'll be honest, uh, hoping to get it out on the street in December. Uh, turnaround time. Uh, the turnaround time. I think it has to be open. I forget how long it has to be open. A couple months. I, I, I forget exactly. I forget too. 60 but days, it, maybe. It would it would like it, it would it, it has a possibility of being on the street by the time we meet in late January. Okay. It's not likely that it would be decided by that point. Okay. Good. All right. Last minute. Who wants to any anything else that you want to raise, complain about? Uh, praise, give praise <laughs> to, we, we take it all, good and bad. Well, thanks for sharing all of this information. It was helpful to learn more um, and for giving us the opportunity to provide feedback. It's what you're there for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, I do have a just a comment, I guess, from things I'm hearing from the field um, with the restart assessments and people are using them. And in fact, uh, Matt, I emailed you because we had some people who were pretty upset at the thought that they would be gone in December. So thank you for that extension. Um, now people are saying, well, why can't this be up next year? I don't understand why it has to stop in June. Um, so I guess keep that on the radar. I don't know if that's a possibility to keep those things open, but you know, our districts are saying from everything they have to do with the one needs assessment and collecting data. And it's very helpful to get that kind of feedback from any RDL. 
Yeah. That's, I, yeah. I mean, I mean the, the intention is not for these to be a one and done deal. It's, it's, it's in many ways, it's a funding thing. Okay. So, so like these, this kind of information is helpful. Um, um, yes, yeah, so we, and it, we may want to think about some ways to collect that a little mm -hmm. bit more. Um, maybe we should put some thought into that. I mean, we, we've got some numbers, um, but I view it as a long-term thing. And in fact, you know, the, the CARES Act that we didn't really talk about that much today, but the, the, the work that we're doing around the CARES Act is designed to support those moving forward. So, well, Chris, I would also throw in there that when we talk about high schools and collecting data and using data, those are particularly useful at the high school level because they are often the the grades and subjects that don't have uh, the type of data collection that is available K-8. Yeah. So I think high schools have, have very much appreciated having those. So if there is a way to continue funding those, I think that would be fantastic. Our yeah, it, you know, as, as we're thinking about this, and again, I'll put some more thought into it, but if, if if you're hearing from schools and there's any schools who are willing to like put their name on it, like yeah. put in writing like they're valuable that would be really helpful too I, I think I think there are but it's just where I you know all right uh, Tammy are you still gonna keep with this group I mean you know, <laughs> not you've had this I group. guess I don't know I mean <laughs> Group yeah, here to if you have any complaints about oh. specific people, let me know. We'll, we can okay. do that. Okay, I'll email you privately. <laughs> See if you could use that two-minute mute function that I think is available now for people when they talk too long or whatever. <laughs> hey, Sarcasm. Chris. Sarcasm. Okay. I appreciate it. It's been great. Thank you, guys. I, I, I'm very, very privileged to join you. All right. Anything hey, else? Chris. Yes. Uh, where where do you guys want those emails directed to? Do you want them to uh, you, Chris? And the reason I'm asking is because I've got a meeting this afternoon that we're, I know that's going to be a topic of conversation where there are people who are really interested in using them. So I'm sure I could get a couple sent today. Yeah, not. send them send them to uh, send them send them to me. That's fine. Oh, okay. Perfect. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Bye, man. We'll talk to you soon. Bye, Bye. everyone. Bye. Bye.